So, Bob, it's been a while since you've been on the podcast. Yeah, like a month, maybe more. And the listeners love you so much. Oh, well. They're always requesting you. Mm. They send in uh, questions just for you. So, really? Yeah. So let's let's read those questions. Okay. Let's answer them. Sure. And see what comes out of our faces. <laughs> Good. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist, a professor, and I'm an email reader. You are indeed. And Who are you? I am your friend for the last 26 years, something like that, and uh, 24 years. I always wonder how long it's been. I think I go through this every time I introduce myself. I say the same stuff like, oh, we've been friends for- Well, it's uh, 95, 95, so, so. It, it's, all, it's summer of 95, so yeah. it would be 20. almost 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and a therapist here in practice in Seattle. Yeah. Patron Mary writes in and says, I have a question for you and Bob. I have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, and my boyfriend claims to be a narcissist with anger issues. Hmm. Um, We both came from abusive childhoods. Hmm. He has some red flags. He can be controlling, but I can be manipulative at times, too. Hmm. His ex-girlfriend claimed he was abusive. Uh, He told me one time that he was abusive with her. Hmm. He was angry at a party and in an argument with her. He grabbed her. And she got hurt. He feels bad about the incident. I don't want to fall into an abusive relationship like my mom did with my dad. I'm worried me and my boyfriend fit into each other's dysfunctional attachment styles. I'm in therapy, but he isn't. We both like to talk and share our past with each other, so that's good. I've listened to your podcast about intimate partner violence, but I just feel so scared and confused because I love him And I don't want to be, but I don't want to be another statistic. Bob, what do you think? So this idea of borderline and narcissism and the worry about that, what do you think? Well, I don't really, I think we are not our diagnoses. So I kind of want to just focus on what actually happens between us as opposed to what's your diagnosis and what's mine. Yeah. So um, not that those, not that the labels, I don't think the labels are bad. Right, and I don't think that they're um, they have utility. They have a certain utility, but um, I wouldn't want to boil either of them down to whether or not they do or do not have some personality disorder. Yeah. But I am curious about you know like okay, so you're worried about there being um, you know uh, domestic violence. You're worried about him getting angry. Are you guys talking about it? When you talk about it, how does it go? Um, um, I I don't. I think that the, a lot of couples, you know, like I, I've, I can't tell you how many times I've advised a couple. Well, you know, you could always have a timeout plan, and I think that's on the one hand a really good idea. But most of us, when we're angry, we won't follow them. So, um, but with practice, you can because yeah. I, I find, and just to interrupt you, sorry, sure. briefly, is that the well, what do you think the worry is about, or why do you think people don't do timeouts when they when a part of them thinks they should? I think um, we get engaged, we're angry, we feel misunderstood, we want our partner to get it, and so we try harder. Yeah, and there's a premise of if I don't convince them now, right. something terrible is going to happen. Yeah, right, right, a kind of a desperation. Yeah. There's a myth. I, I can't let them go on with right. that thought in their head right? Uh, because I'm going to lose them Yeah, because I need them to understand that they're the one who's wrong and I'm not, I'm not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and if because if I'm wrong, then they'll leave me. Right. They don't consciously say this themselves, but this is no. absolutely the premise that underlies the desperation. Yeah. And so to target that in the moment, cognitively, narratively, schema wise as well, to just be like, I know it feels desperate because it feels like uh, if I don't convince them of this, something bad is going to happen. And if I think about it, I guess I'm worried they're going to leave me, but I don't really think think that's going to happen. There's not any evidence they're going to leave me. Mm-hmm. So this can wait until tomorrow or this can wait until I, you know, things change. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's one of the biggest uh, things you can do to improve your life in your, in your relationships is give it a day mm-hmm. or even just give it four hours. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you know, th- everyone out there, think about all the times you know, you have felt so angry at your spouse, whether it's a current spouse or a past spouse. You're just like, I am done with this person or 
what the hell was that bullshit? Sure. Or they are just ridiculous. That human being is just so ridiculous. And like, what is wrong with that person? You fast forward a day and you're like, well, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> right. The dust settles and somehow we <laughs> come back to earth. And yeah, the next day you're just like, yeah, well, you know, you win some, you lose some. Yeah. Or, well, you know, she's better than my previous girlfriend. Right, or, right. or, well, you know, well, it's probably all my fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my, <laughs> like, my feelings, yeah. Yeah, you know, give it a day, you know, like it does so much. Um, and so so having that time out is, is, such a, is such a great thing. But anyway, I was interrupting you. No, no, not at all. I like what you're saying. Because I think you're right about the thing that we tell ourselves. We don't necessarily say it in words, but I have to get through to you now. Right. Right. As if. So. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And that compels, because uh, often in these relationships, there's one person that might be willing to pull away to sort of say, mm -hmm. let's, let's give it some time mm -hmm. or something. And usually it's one person who's pursuing, not all the time. Um, and so it's the person who's pursuing who can do some work on that to mm -hmm. be secure. I mean, it's, it's a hard thing, obviously, to catch 22 yeah. for a lot of people because in order to be secure, they have to be reassured. And in that right. moment, they can't, there's, can't. there's not access to yeah. that. We all need to learn how to self-soothe too. Yeah, but it's so hard, you it know, if, hard. If, if you've been relationally traumatized. Oh, yeah, it's very hard. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the things that I do recommend for people as I'm working on this is I say, try to go blank. I mean, not dissociate per se in a pathological sense, but... Because there's no there's no way to outthink the situation, and so sometimes if there's no way to out outthink the situation, sometimes just like don't think at all, mm -hmm. like just do anything other than think about it. Mm -hmm. Go for a run, go to a movie, watch a TV show, uh, go to sleep. Honestly, just yeah. you know, because your brain is in such a state that you yeah. can't you can't think straight. But anyway, yeah, right. But I really like what you're saying, Bob. You know, you're saying we're not our diagnoses. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, uh, we're not. We can't be reduced to that. Also, even if we were our diagnoses, it's not a death sentence. You know, I have never met, and you know, I, I said this out loud on the podcast a few months ago, and I was surprised at the words coming out of my mouth. You know, sometimes I say things that are true to me, yeah. and I'm discovering it at the same time as the listeners are. Oh, and and nice. this is one of those statements. I said, I've never met anyone who wasn't on a personality disorder spectrum. Oh, yeah. Right. If not multiple. Well, yeah, right. When I said that, I was like, wait, did I just say that? Does that make sense? That yeah. does make sense. Right. What? Everyone is on the on at least one personality disorder spectrum. Every, you know, everyone is either narcissistic, paranoid, avoidant, uh, histrionic, psychopathic, narcissistic, uh, schizoid, schizotypal, you know, what What? What are the other ones I'm leaving off of I here? I forgot borderline. But uh, obsessive, compulsive, yeah. borderline. Pa paranoid. Um, they had the paranoid, but they got rid of it, right? Did they? Well, paranoid I still PD. use it. Yeah. Uh, and it, everyone's on one of those spec spectra because the a chance of you uh, going through your zero to five years of age without any complications is zero. You're, you're going to have some complicated... The thing I always I always say this, and I, you know, I, I guess bears repeating, is that all of us as infants were disappointed. That's why we were crying. Yeah. We weren't crying. Half the time, you know, when a three-year-old's crying, it's because they're trying to manipulate or they're trying to communicate something. It's It's got a function. Yeah. They're not actually falling apart. But the other half of the time, they are falling apart. It, but... To a six-month-old, when they're crying, they're falling apart. To a 12-month-old, often, they're falling apart. There's no way around it. You know, as a child, you're just, you don't have a, the ability to soothe yourself. You don't have the ability to get your own food and tell other people that you're too hot or you, that you actually want the cell phone. And, you know, how come I can't have the cell phone or the keys or the, why can't I have the remote? Like, right. that doesn't make any sense. You get to have the remote. Yeah. Why can't I have the remote? Right. And it, so you're devastated on a minute by minute basis and also ecstatic on a minute by minute basis. Right. 
And through those difficulties, which are no joke, you develop defense mechanisms and uh, that becomes your personality disorder as you grow up, you know, whether it's my style is to uh, laugh it off and deny, uh, which has pros and cons, or my style is to depend on myself and Mm -hmm. try to have good self-esteem and Mm -hmm. realize that not everyone is there for me. That has its pros and cons. Sure. I'm going to have a style where I try to reach out for reassurance from other people that I'm a good person and that I'm loved. Uh, that has pros and cons. You know, all these things are going to... So when you say, you know, we're not our diagnoses and, you know, this person, okay, fine. Yeah. You've identif- you self-identify as someone with borderline personality and your uh, partner identifies as someone with narcissism. These, uh, you know, okay. Yeah. Uh, you're normal. Now what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now it doesn't... You know, a lot of times... I get a lot of emails from people. It's like... You know, I have, I've been, border, I've been diagnosed with borderline. Can I be a therapist? Hmm. And it's like, well, all, again, all therapists are on some personality disorder spectrum. So you're, you just happen to know yours. Good for you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and yours coincidentally actually makes you have some pretty good strengths as a therapist. You notice yeah. other people a lot. Right. You understand suffering. Yeah you're not going to pathologize people's personality disorders. Hopefully not. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. You're, you're less prone to it. I suppose you're, you're going to understand yeah. attachment injury and right. desperation more than the average person, which yeah. everyone suffers from, which is the basis of all the personality disorders, in my opinion, even psychopathy, antisocial. Oh, um, no shit. You really think that? I do. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I mean, there's no way to know. Well, you can't really know, but, I just have this, it, call it a religion. I just have this belief that all humans at a base level, in the same way that we all desire water for thirst and food for hunger, we also all desire attachment and to please other people. Well, yeah. And for psych- psychopaths and uh, you know severe ones, they are characterized as people who don't have empathy and who don't care and right. are manipulating people to their own gain and mm-hmm. pathologically lie. They don't really care about other people's feelings. Yeah. And they're even characterized them as people don't have feelings. Oh, well, yeah, that's um, not true. Right. Uh, but what I ha- have come, cause that's the one personality disorder where it's just like, cause borderline is pretty easy to conceptualize in a sympathetic way. Narcissism, a little harder, but easy for me. Um, and all the other ones for sure. But when it comes to psychopathy, there's like, well, you know, psychopaths, they're sort of in this other class. Uh-huh. And some people even characterize them as, as, a, as a completely different, like, race of humans. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's this... And sometimes even... I even kind of talk about it that way. But I believe, based on my investigations, but it's just um, on actual case studies and actual clients that I've worked with, um, and but there's no way to prove this. Yeah. But I according to my belief system and it holds up in terms of my theory of personality is that they also grew up wanting attachment and something happened where they had to learn their defense was to exploit other people to get their needs met. Mm -hmm. So they're three years old and they want attachment and they also want self-esteem. They want power. They want to feel safe. They want attention and they because of the the way their environment was, they determined that the best way or the only way to get those needs met was to uh, scheme against other people and also to basically turn off one's emotion, uh, empathy towards other people because mm-hmm. it, it was the only way to get their needs met. Mm-hmm. If they had empathy for other people, given their environment when they were two, three, four, five, six, if they had empathy, they wouldn't be able to actually get their needs met because they would care too much about the other person's feelings and thus they wouldn't engage in the defense of actually manipulating them to get their needs met. Because you find a lot of psychopaths will do a lot of things related to attachment and power over other people. They, they want to be in a relationship, but so they manipulate other people to, to fall in love with them. Uh, they want people to see them as worthy, so they manipulate people so they can move up the corporate ladder. They want people to uh, have sex with, normal, so they 
uh, manipulate other people into having sex with them or something, you know. Yeah. So their their need is the same as anyone else's, but their method of getting it is pathological and harmful to other people. Yeah. The same can be said about borderline and narcissism, right? Uh, a borderline person, someone who suffers from, from borderline, wants attachment from other people, but they feel like they need to demand it from other people at times, or they need to uh, be hyper vigilant, yeah. shall we say, about mm. the attachment from the other person, right. um, rather than not being hyper vigilant by <laughs> by being slightly vigilant, you know, uh, and that shoots them in the foot. Um, and to convince the person suffering from borderline that they don't need to be hyper vigilant is like at first a no go it doesn't make any sense to them they're like well, what do you mean like but if i don't if i don't yeah. do that you, you don't understand like right. no one will love me right. and I, i'll get nothing yeah like you, you're crazy <laughs> you know like, yeah, i kind of right. know what's wrong with you right. um to the psychopath you know you don't need to manipulate other people to love you they can love you for who you are well that's crazy talk yeah you know that's you know i don't even understand what you're saying to right. me you know it doesn't make any sense i'm, I'm trying to make a sale over here that's yeah. how you do it. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you think, uh, folks with that presentation, maybe their empathy has been punished. Yeah. Could yeah. be as well. Could be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of different presentations, uh, that I've heard in case studies. Namely, it's like serial killers that I hear about. Well, yeah, that's what you hear about. And so of course you get scared. Uh, Right. I mean, it feels like alien and other, because that's right. really, it's pretty threatening shit to think that what's in you is in me. Right. Yeah. The vast majority of psychopaths never kill anybody. Yeah. And never want to. Right. So uh, that that's a misnomer. Um, and there's also a class of psychopaths that are like the hair psychopath, who is like the in and out of prison, criminal versatility person. What does the hair part mean? Uh, hair is, I can't remember his first name, but he... Oh, it's a guy. A guy who yeah. uh, wrote the psychopath test. He's the, you know, whenever we talk about psychopathy these days, we tend to talk about his conceptualization of it. Got it. Anyway. Um, so, yeah. So, anonymous patron, or Mary, actually. Patron Mary. Did we answer Mary's question? Uh, no. But, I mean, we did kind of. So, uh, she's saying, okay, borderline narcissism. Yeah. Uh, it, can it work? And you and I are saying absolutely. Yeah. There, it, it's it, it's not. It, it you, you'll read online yeah. that it's a, it's a no go, but there's absolutely no yeah. no reason. How's it going so far? I guess this is an important question. Are we fighting a lot? Are we having conflict? How do we deal with conflict when we have it? Right. You exactly. Know? That's that's the you know your own good sense is probably worth more than what you might read. It's probably worth more. Is more, worth more than what you read online or. What you boil down to a diagnosis. Right. You're both aware that you have issues, which is, you know, light years ahead of right. what a lot of other people uh, exhibit. Right. You, ad you admit that you have borderline personality. Yeah. Your partner admits that he has narcissistic traits. Yeah. That's a big step. Yeah. The ability to do that is a big deal. Uh, the fact that he can look back on previous abusive behavior and feel bad about it is also a step. Does it mean now? Uh, does it mean that there's not going to be bad incidents? Um, no, there's probably going to be some incidents. There's risk. Yeah, there's uh, the very least. There's going to be anger yeah. between the two of you. There's anger. There's anger between everybody. Yeah. Uh, can you? Uh, the two of you. Uh, manage that without it becoming abusive to either one of you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, will it borderline on abuse? Probably. A lot of couples uh, dip into abusive language. Yeah. Like, you're a piece of shit, mm. or I hate you, mm. or what's wrong with you, right. or you always do this, right. you never think right, you know, these kinds of things are yeah. common hurtful statements that one could characterize as abuse, particularly if it's done in a certain way, in a, yeah. in a pervasive way. Yeah. A lot of couples do that. You apologize for it uh, as best you can. You avoid it as best you can. I can't recommend couple therapy more, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but looking at uh, the, the positive prognostic signs, he, again, he admits he's a narcissist with anger issues. You say that he likes to open up and talk about his issues with you. 
So that's great. That's good. You're in therapy. That's great. Yeah. I mean, at the very least, you can ask your therapist, am I in an abusive relationship? Am I going down the slippery slope right now? Mm. And your therapist will be there to explore that with you. You know, it, one of the things that seems to me is, do I feel safe? Yeah. Like maybe there's shit that's happened between us. Okay, fine. There's shit that's happened between us. How are we at repairing it? And having repaired it, if we have, how do I feel now? Do I feel safe? Do I feel in love with you? You know, how, how's it actually going? Right. Yeah. Do I feel safe to tell him yeah. what's on my mind? Right. That's a, if it always ask that question. And maybe sometimes you don't feel safe. No. It doesn't mean that it's a no-go. It just means, yeah. okay, how do I get back to safety? Right. Do I need to get help and support? Do I need to advocate for myself? You know, what do I need? Do I need to break up? Yeah. What do, do I, I want to get back to safety with so-and-so? Right. Yeah. Another positive is that borderline and narcissism actually can work well together. And I've seen it before. It's a pursuer distancer thing. Yeah. Uh, narcissism, uh, people... Uh, narcissistic people tend to act like they're fine when they're not, <laughs> which is a, there's pros and cons to that. They tend to look stable mm -hmm. and they tend to believe they're stable and they tend to be kind of stable as long as everything's going well for them. The borderline person is going to have more ups and downs. There's So there's a benefit to that. As the borderline person goes up and down, the narcissistic person can remain kind of steady. Uh, as long as it's within a good range. Yeah, right. Um, and, but it can result in big conflict yeah. as well, obviously, because as the borderline person is just like, how come you never open up? Or how come you're so distant? Or, right. uh, and the narcissistic person would be like, how come everything's an ordeal with you? How come everything's a problem? How come we can't just go to the park and have it go, okay, you know, yeah. why does it always have to be a fight? So... The negative signs that you identify is that he's not in therapy, so that's that's you know a negative sign. He's mm -hmm. been he's been violent in the past, yeah. So he you know his tendency is there. It's a risk factor, huh? It's a risk factor, right? He's already been controlling to you, mm -hmm. so I hope that you have conversations about that, right? And. The thing is, is he's just as borderline as you are, is the thing. He just deals with it in a narcissistic way. So assume he has the same emotional feelings, meaning that he's terrified of losing you. He demonstrates that through controlling because he believes he knows the answers. That's his defense is like, you're moving away from me. I feel bad. I'm superior. I know the answers. Let me tell you what to do. Mm. And uh, so to if you want to help him uh, if the two of you want to work on this you can help him and he can learn how to express himself in a vulnerable way which is very scary to the to the narcissistic person but over time as you behaviorally reinforce that behavior through good behavior such as hugging and kissing and reassuring and reacting well to then it'll go better you know he says something like um you know where were you uh you're late for getting home from work or something and you say uh you say okay i'm getting a controlling vibe are you are you worried that about something about me is there some kind of worry or did i do something to hurt your feelings no i i'm can a husband just be concerned about where his wife was after work yeah and you're giving a vibe of controlling right which indicates to me that you're scared of something you know what are you scared of right. let me hug you you this know is that thing that you do yeah yeah oh well i guess i was worried i don't know that something happened to you or i don't know that you cheated on me you know because my previous wife cheated on me or something right. okay honey thanks for telling me i wasn't cheating on you yeah i was just a little late and uh, I just lost a track of time. I just stayed late. I was chatting with Karen and da da da. Yeah. You know, um, you know. I guess I could have texted. Is that you know? Are you okay now? Yeah, I'm okay now. Um, you know, that's after five years, a couple therapy. <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> uh, you also say that you have already been manipulative with him, which is not a good you know sign. Mm -hmm. I don't like that word. I guess I'd like her to be more descriptive about what she finds herself doing. Yeah. Well, 
What do you suspect she's talking about? Uh, using indirect means. Like for what? Means to get what? Oh, I don't know what she wants. Yeah. Probably reassurance is usually the thing. Yeah. Attachment security, right? Yeah. Um, like, uh, I'm just trying to think of something that would be typical. Like, uh, I don't know, making him jealous, maybe. Or oh, yeah, right. trying to get him to open up through manipulative way. I don't know. Using sex manipulative. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Just a lot of different options. Interesting. What, yeah. What, what she might mean. And borderline and narcissistic personalities tend to have lower attachment security, which can be a volatile combo. Um, not only for, I guess, violence, but just more generally. Just high, higher conflict. Yeah. Just harder to get along with each other because right. you're going to trigger each other more. Yeah. You're both going to have trouble reassuring yourself and staying differentiated through difficult times. Right. Um, but those are those are true about any relationship. To some degree or other. Right. Yeah. There's not a single relationship on this planet that doesn't have at least, you know, some of these issues yeah. negatively. Like right. your personalities aren't entirely compatible, <laughs> one. Yeah. Two, you're going, you, you both have some insecure attachment tendencies. Right. That's true about anybody. Right. And you're going to trigger each other and you're going to react. And so, you know, keep talking about it and keep working Absolutely. it out. So it's definitely not doomed. Yeah. And there's there's tons of positive things there. Yeah. Uh, another email here, anonymous patron. It's a long one. Okay. You ready, Bob? I'm ready. I've been in therapy for about seven months and my therapist is wonderful. Slowly, over the past few months of therapy, I have come to the realization that my husband is emotionally abusive to me. Oh, we're in a similar wow. zone here. Yeah. I have come to the realization that my husband is emotionally abusive to me. It has gotten worse since we had a baby one year ago. I went to therapy thinking everything was my fault and that was clearly something wrong and that there was clearly something wrong with me. By talking it out with my therapist, I realized I felt like everything was my fault and that I was crazy because that was my husband was trying to convince me of. Huh? By, t by talking it out with my therapist, I realized that I felt like everything was my fault and that I was crazy because that was my husband, because that was, because my, basically my husband was trying to convince me that it yeah. was all my fault. Right. I've been trying to do couples counseling as well with a different therapist. We have been trying to do couples counseling with a different therapist, but he has been resistant to anything that is different than what he already believes and makes everything out to be my fault in couple therapy. Wow. Now, I'm not perfect. I've contributed to things too, and sure. I will take responsibility for those things, but he refuses to take responsibility for his own actions. I have become a bit stronger now, so I'm not willing to take on that responsibility for him anymore, and he does not appreciate that. Hmm. Our next session with our couples counselor is next week, and I am planning to tell him that I want a divorce. Wow. I am scared of his reaction, but my therapist is talking me through a safety plan for afterwards, just in case he has a particularly bad reaction. Because of the fear, I go back and forth about whether or not to leave, even though I know it is the right choice and it is what is best for everyone in the long run. Oh. My therapist was clear that she can't diagnose anyone, she isn't seeing, but a while back she talked to me about people with narcissistic personality traits and using that as a frame to help me understand some of my husband's behavior and reactions and how that has been interacting with my preoccupied attachment. Oh. I did find it very helpful. And this is what led me to your podcast. Oh. I appreciate you advocating for people with narcissistic personality disorder to be more understood and less judged. But I find that sometimes listening to this makes me think that I should stay with him and try to help him get better instead of leaving. Wait, let oh. me try a minute. Have I read this email on the podcast before? I, I'm not familiar with it. I feel like I've read this email on the podcast before. Okay. <laughs> Recently. Anyway, just continue. Uh, I find that sometimes listening to this, to you, you talk about narcissism, makes me think that I should stay with him and try to help him get better instead of leaving. My therapist has said that I need to think more about myself and my well-being and that it isn't my job to fix things for other people. But when I think about how he may have become this way in the beginning, I have an urge to help him get better so he can feel better and be a better father to our baby. Can you explain to me 
how to have empathy for someone like my husband and still think about taking care of myself at the same time. Bob, what do you think? Huh. How do you have empathy for someone like him yeah. while taking care of herself at the same time? Because to her, it's sort yeah. of a dichotomy, you know? Or right, right. They seem incompatible. incompatible. Yeah. You know, um, just from, you know that Aesop's fable about the frog and the scorpion? Frog and scorpion come to the side of this um, lake and they both want to cross. And frog can swim, of course. And scorpion says, if you carry me on your back, I can get across. I can't swim. And frog says, if I carry you on my back. You're going to sting me. And Scorpion says, well, um, I'm not going to sting you because I don't want to drown either and I can't swim. So if I sting you, we're both done. So Frog listens to that and says, oh, okay. And um, Scorpion climbs on Frog's back and they start swimming across the thing and Scorpion stings Frog. And Frog says, you said you weren't going to sting me. And Scorpion says, I can't not be a scorpion. I don't know, you know, like, um, um, I think, uh, if you're having trouble with empathy, um, is it, is it that important? I don't know. Like, I guess I think if you're having trouble with empathy, then, um, maybe it means that the, your own need has not been attended to, but you can respect a scorpion and not let one crawl on your back. Yeah. So are, are you saying that? So when she says, like, you know, Kirk, you say you give a conceptualization of narcissism that is sympathetic, you know, that, that makes me say, because, you know, whenever I talk yeah. about any personality disorder, yeah. as I did earlier, I always give a sympathetic view. I'm yeah. saying, like... This is this is a, the way attachment the attachment difficulties show up in adult lives, and we put a label on it. We call it narcissism or whatever. That's how you talk about it. Right. Right. Not to say that those personality disorders don't produce suffering for them and people around them. Right. But it's not their fault. No. It's not anyone's fault. It it just kind of happens to us. Yeah. So. Right. It's not even their parents' fault because their parents parented in the best way that they could. Yeah. And they were just surviving and trying to do the best right. they could. Right. So it, it's, it, I, I have a hard time blaming anyone for anything. Uh, uh, so there's that. Right. And so when I say that, she says, well, I'm compelled to not leave my husband because, uh, uh, you know, I want to, I don't want to, I don't want to break up with him and divorce him and leave him because of something that wasn't his fault. What do you say to that? Well, it sounds like it might be that this, another version of the same thing that happens to her, which is she finds herself undermining her position on things. Like when I assert my position, I get kind of anxious and I think, oh, wait, wait, um, I must be out of balance. I must be putting myself too far ahead of my partner and I have to rebalance and rebalance probably, if I'm hearing correctly, rebalance means ignore myself and just acquiesce. Right. Right. And I hear her with a very natural or um, a very understandable um, urge to acquiesce. And it doesn't take much. Maybe some anonymous guy in a podcast and he says this thing and suddenly her um, courage is undermined again. What a hard thing to be. I don't think that anybody, I don't think people leave marriages lightly and nobody leaves them with absolute certainty. Right. And what are you going to do? Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Uh, I've worked with many people in your shoes, anonymous patron, whether it's an abusive spouse or they just want to leave. Yeah. And the thing I always tell clients as they're beginning to explore this is I, I want to, I try to lay, and I've ta talked about this on the podcast before, I lay the landscape and I say, so I hear you beginning to talk about your desire to potentially div get divorced. I want to tell you that I will support anything that you do because there's you, you ha this is a decision that every spouse has to make for themselves, you know, mm, right. in a sense, every day of their lives. Every day of your life, you're making a decision. Yeah. And yeah. if you stay together, then every day you wake up and say, yeah, I'm going to stay together. Right. So it's it's a thing that we all have to do. It's a responsibility, and it, and there's and no one can tell you the right answer to that. Yeah, nobody it's, can. It's up to you. Yeah. 
I, I do you get annoyed when you hear these therapist types tell couples you guys should break up? Oh my god, it bugs the shit out of me. Well, not only that, I mean, but individual therapy too, which is much more prone. Oh, worse, yeah, totally worse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you should leave this person. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I derailed you. Sorry about that. No, you're no, saying I'm each glad day, you're, each I'm day we make a choice. Yeah, and so, uh, so what was I saying? Something about supporting client. You know, you say you sort of lay it out. Look oh, right, at right. Whatever you decide. Right, right. So, so what I say is, you know, it, it, it's up to you. And then what I say is, uh, especially if they say something like, "I definitely want a divorce." Oh, yeah. They'll say something like that. And I say, so just to lay the landscape here, I've worked with a lot of people who have come to this realization. And what I'm going to tell you is that, in typically 98 percent of the time what's going to happen is you, you this is going to fluctuate for you yeah that you're sure of it now but next month a year from now you're going to change your mind uh i don't know that and it might not happen sure but law of averages it's going to happen yeah and that doesn't mean you don't divorce today that's no. up to you yeah but just so you know what's on my mind is I'm here to support you as you go through this process. Mm -hmm. Even if you did decide and file the papers, mm -hmm. I've seen people pull out mm -hmm. through you know midway or at the end of the process. I've mm -hmm. seen people get divorced, get remarried. Sure. I've seen people separate, move out, and then move back in and yeah. do it several times. Yeah. And so it, it's complicated. Uh, once you get past, I don't know, 25, then things are 30 or I don't know some there's some, some age there where breakups on average especially when you have kids are like five years long right where it takes a long time there's a lot of last ditch efforts there's and so uh so when you know when you say to the honest patron uh you're wanting to leave because of the abuse mm -hmm. and you've made that choice mm -hmm. And then I, on the podcast, come out and say this thing that's sympathetic towards people with narcissism. Mm -hmm. And that pushes you back into the camp of like, well, maybe I shouldn't leave. Yeah. Well, that's just normal is what you're saying. It's just like, that just happens. Yeah. You know, you, people vacillate. They go back and forth. And yeah. the fact that I, that I said something is kind of a minor detail. The major detail is that breaking up is hard and it's, it's messy hard. and, and, you're going to vacillate yeah. and you have second thoughts yeah. and that's okay. And, and you sort know, of you, just the lay of the land. Yeah. yeah. A big reason why I tell clients this whole thing is because um, as they say, I want a divorce, say they say it for like a month. Yeah. Well, what I, what I never do as a therapist is I, I'm never like, okay, well you got to do it now. Yeah, right. You made a commitment. Right. Um, and I, I, because I don't want to, come across like I'm not supportive of what they're doing. I want to tell them that, uh, you know, I, I'm just sort of on their coattails as they go through this process. Yeah. Uh, I'm don't, being dragged along, you know. <laughs> you don't pick a path because they said one day I want to get a divorce. You don't yeah. hook, your, hook yourself to that and say, well, now you have to. Right. You follow wherever they go. Because that can be a big relationship rupture. Oh, man. You know, when you, like, you tell your therapist something, like, right. I'm definitely doing this. And then you don't do it. And you then you're driving it. to therapy the next session. Right. And you're like, oh, shit. Now I have to tell my therapist I didn't do that thing I was going to do. Right. Well, that's that happens more often than not. Oh, yeah. And so I want to tell my clients, because I don't want them to have that thought in their head as they're driving to therapy with sure. me. Because I want them to know that I literally do not care. I care. I want them to do what they are. Sure. But I have no personal interest in them even being even following through on their own commitments right. that they made in front of me. You know, that's one of those process content things, mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh, we could talk about you're coming to therapy and you feel all self-conscious and like you've been a bad client or whatever. We can talk about that. That's probably really useful and important to learn about because we're learning something about how you roll in relationships. But the actual content of are you letting me down is, you know, uh, not relevant. Right. Yeah. But as I, we were talking earlier, some therapists will get locked into that. Yeah. Which is... Individual therapists probably more so than others. It's just so silly. Yeah. Like, w did you become a therapist to bark bark at people and tell them what to do? Like, yeah. and, and think you know what they're supposed to do? 
But the bottom line here, anonymous patron, that I believe I read this email in another huh. episode, which is just so weird to think of doing the same thing twice and not really realizing oh. it. Or I had you a very to find sim- out if you're consistent. Maybe it's a very similar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The thing I want to say, which I think I said before, uh, is that. Uh, just because you have empathy for someone doesn't mean that you have to endure their abuse. Yeah. I have empathy for everybody. I have empathy for people that I never want to see again. <laughs> I have empathy for people that I actively avoid. Yeah. I have empathy for people whom I have a, labeled as abusive and terrible human beings. Yeah. They're terrible human beings. They have done terrible, terrible things to me and yeah. people I love. Yeah. And I, but and I have an, I have a conceptualization that is sympathetic to them as to why they are the way that they are and why they do the things they do. But I'll be damned if I'm going to fucking come within 10 feet of those people. I never want to talk to those people again. Yeah. I, want the, I want them out of my life. Sure. I'll be damned if I have to spend another minute even looking at those people. So, and yet I have empathy for them. Yeah, scorpions are not bad creatures. They're just scorpions. So I'm not going to let them get on my back as I walk across, as I go across the river. Yeah. Fuck, fuck them. Yeah. You know? So if... If you are saying to yourself that you're just like, I don't want to be in this relationship anymore, anymore. I've given it a try. He's had plenty of opportunity to take responsibility and be a nice person and be a human being who actually like apologizes for the things that he does, or at least open to the idea that he might be at fault for at least half of the conflict. Yeah, big blind spot. Uh, He, uh, he's, he hasn't, he hasn't made that leap. Maybe it's because of the severe abuse he went through. I don't know. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, I I wish him well. I'm not going to stand in his way, but I don't want to live with him anymore because he drags me down. He puts me down. I feel like shit. My life is so much better when he's when I don't live with him. Yeah. Uh, me and my kids are better off without him around. Like, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, you know. Then by all means, yeah, leave him. Uh, again, up to you. Yeah, if that's what your wisdom calls, then best to listen uh some other questions what is the likelihood that someone who has a significant number of narcissistic personality traits uh like rage issues would be willing to get help if f- willing to get help for it if a loved one helps them versus if they get there on their own do you understand that question are they saying if somebody like does an intervention and says hey i love you but you got to take care of this as opposed to um the person having insight yeah, like uh, I think she's asking, should I try to get him into therapy? Should I try to persuade him into therapy? Oh. W- would that work oh, as opposed knows? to, or do, does it need to come from within him? I guess. Oh, um, well, um, I, I don't, there's nothing wrong with giving people feedback. Yeah, you know, like, hey, this is my experience of you. This is what it's like for me, or I think this is causing you suffering. Yeah, I get a, I get I get this I get a version of this question almost every week and the because there's a lot of people out there listening who have people in their lives who are uh, who who through the information on this podcast are like, "Oh my god, my brother or my mom or my spouse or my kids um, have this personality issue, this attachment issue, and with therapy you're saying this will help them." I've been trying to get them to go to therapy and they won't go. Mm. What do I do? And I'll tell you from personal experience, I have had very close people in my life who I absolutely diagnosed. You know, people always, do you diagnose your friends? Absolutely. I diagnose everyone. I, di- <laughs> I diagnose myself. I can't help it. You know what I mean? It's, I'm not going to, I'm not going to become a dumbass when I'm walking, you know, I'm not gonna, yeah, you don't forget everything you know. Yeah. I mean, a plumber walks into a, a leaky faucet room. They're not going to be like, I don't know what's happening. You know, the plumber's yeah. going to be like, there's a leak. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, but the notion of diagnosing people doesn't demean them. It just means I just understand how personality works yeah, and how it, about attachment in injury. Yeah. yeah. Um, and with some of these people, I have really gone on a campaign over months, years. Oh, right. To get them in therapy. Yeah. Does it work? Uh, it's almost never worked. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, you know, everyone has to make that choice for themselves. Sure. And sometimes, occasionally, 1% of the time when you give someone an ultimatum, they go and it, they get hooked and they like it. I mean, I will remember this one time. It takes a... 
a, a particular kind of therapeutic intervention, though. You know, I've talked about this incident in the past, but this uh, family came into therapy and the father wasn't jazzed. Oh, I, yeah. I told you about this story. Yeah, keep going. The father wasn't jazzed about therapy. Long story short, um, we got into, him and I got into a big fight and I was like, I'm never going to see this guy again because he hates being in therapy. He hates me. I hate him. He's he's abusive to his son. Uh, I'm just going to let him have it and I'll, and I'll walk away with my conscience clean because I didn't beat around the bush with him. Yeah. And I told him what's up and he didn't like it. And we got an argument and then uh, I didn't let down. Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, I just kept at it. And then uh, for some reason we hugged at the end of it, which was weird. Mm -hmm. And then he hired me as his individual therapist for, you know, a couple years. And every session he would cry about halfway through, he'd just start bawling about basically the way his dad treated him. Mm, poor guy. And, uh, so at the beginning, you know, he wasn't really interested in going to therapy, but that was one of the incidents where something happened and he was sort of pushed in a direction that he actually benefited, you know, and, and wanted to go to therapy. Yeah. But I think that's pretty rare. I think in my, and of all, I could tell you all these other stories where that didn't work out. Sure. Hey, so one of the things that occurred to me as I was sort of mulling this over was how does the person feel if if the person that they want to go to therapy doesn't go? Like, let's say I speak to them about it and they don't take my advice. Is there some feeling there? Is there some sense of responsibility? Like, are you feeling like you have to engineer it? Right. I mean, I don't know. But you don't, but... Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is not your responsibility. You, I mean, it... If you want to care and if you want to try, go for it. But uh, he's a grown man. Yeah. He can figure it out for himself. He knows therapists exist. And, it, you know, it's not... That's what I always say. It's like, do you think he doesn't know therapy exists? <laughs> like, <laughs> like uh, suggesting therapy to him, do you think... Uh, he doesn't know that that's an option. Yeah. He's he's choosing not to do it. Right. So I wrote back to her, and then here's her reply. Oh, you wrote back? Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you so much for your response to my email. I told my husband that I wanted a divorce. He refused to leave our home and refused to let me go with the baby. I ended up getting a temporary restraining order. So he didn't come home, and I didn't have to have any contact with him at all for two weeks. At first, it was marvelous. I love that word, marvelous. Yeah. You're marvelous, baby. <laughs> I was able to make my own decisions, take my daughter out of the house with me, and I wasn't constantly worried about his reactions to things. I felt so relieved. I had no idea how bad I was feeling until it stopped. Mm. It's a pretty good indication that yeah. you made a good choice. Right. But I was not ready for the extreme feelings of emptiness and loneliness I feel now. Yeah, right. There is just this big empty space inside of my chest that I do not know how to fill. I feel lost and I don't know how to make decisions about the most basic things mm -hmm. or how to decide what I want to do and what I want to prioritize. Right. And I am not talking about big life goals. I'm talking about whether to clean the floors or do the laundry or what yeah. I want to eat for dinner. Right. These were all things that my husband would control. And now I have no idea what to do. I haven't found a lot of information out there about the immediate emotional aftermath after leaving an abusive person. This is truly awful as a feeling, and I can understand why people go back to these relationships an average of seven times before leaving for good. Nice. Without the support of my therapist, I would have felt very tempted to go back just to avoid the feelings I'm having. Right. I'm wondering if you, and Bob too, because Bob is wonderful. No, oh, thank you. With exclamation points and smiley faces. Wow. I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering if you two could talk about, on the podcast, about the emotional aftermath of leaving abusive relationships. People don't only go back because of finances. No. I wish there was more information about this online. I'm sure others feel this way too. Bob, what do you think? I think that um, that person is directly confronting, uh, I hate that word, uh, experiencing her attachment need. Yeah. And um, the attachment need is in the relationship. When people stay together, it is indeed because they're attached and not just because of things like practicalities and money and so forth. They are indeed attached. And it is our natural tendency to seek the attachment object. 
Right. Uh, awful language. Anyways, so the fact that she has these kinds of feelings makes all the sense in the universe because her attachment needs are still there. And while they may have been frustrated, um, she was certainly getting a lot of... Um, there was a lot of activity to try to get the needs met, you know, like the focus on the other person's behavior and all that, you know, like what do I got to do to appease and so forth and the loss of sense of self and, you know. So um, let's see, where was I going with that? Oh, now she doesn't have the distraction. Right. Yeah. So, hey, I think it's a good problem. I right. mean, it's a fucking problem, but it's a good problem. It's a better problem than you were having. And... Um, yeah, you're probably going to have to suffer for a while as you figure yourself out and as you um, get your very natural, very human attachment needs perhaps met in another relationship when you're up for it or um, through your personal counseling, I hope. I hope that's often a good source of uh, sense of connection and so forth. Right. Sounds like you got a good one too, therapist-wise. Yeah. Yeah, Anyways, well said. Thanks. The uh, common belief around abusive relationships is you have this perfectly like secure, uh, I don't know, differentiated person who's with a very undifferentiated person. The abusive person is the quote unquote crazy one. Mm -hmm. And the abused person is, we, we sort of identify with the abused person. Yeah. You know, it's like they're, they're the, they don't have any problems other mm. than the spouse who's abusive. Yeah. And if they could just get away, then everything will yeah. be fine. They're just on the bad side of things. They just need to get out. Yeah. And then it's it's riding off into the sunset, baby. Right. And that is just not usually yeah, the case. It's not the case. The tragedy about growing up with relational trauma and particularly abuse is that you end up being attracted to abusive people. It's this double, double tragedy, which is just so horrible mm. that you have to experience it as a child, which is awful. And then because of that, you're compelled to repeat it in your adult life. Whereas people who don't grow up with relational traumas and don't grow up with abuse also tend to repeat that in their adult life. Yeah. So because they got the luck of the draw they don't have to worry about being attracted to abusive people and they're, or when they are, they very quickly pull out because yeah. it doesn't fit in with their, rep you know, repetition compulsion or their, it doesn't uh, fit in. So for you, you have now discovered or you're an, you're a, you're face to face with what we call dependent personality. You grew up with relational traumas that caused you to believe that you don't, really have a self mm. and you don't know who you are or what you want. Right. A perfect person to be with is someone who's very assertive. You're going to be very attracted to someone like that. It's going to feel good because it's just like, I don't know what to do with myself. I don't know how to make choices. I don't know. Without someone telling me what to do, I don't know where to even access that part of myself that tells me what to do the way that other people seem to be able to do. Right. Like what I want for dinner. Yeah. Should I clean the floor? Right. It's not that you don't know what you want for dinner. Uh -huh. It's that you don't have access to it because when you were two, three, four years old, there was something about your environment that made you punished for even asserting that or even looking at it. And so you, you, you just turned away from yourself and now it's, it's, it's like you're, you know, you're rigidly looking away from yourself, you mm -hmm. know? And so it's going to take a lot of time to turn around and look at yourself and go like, oh yeah, okay, I guess I do know what I want mm -hmm. and I do have feelings and I, I do have preferences and I, mm -hmm. uh, I, um, I can live alone and I, I can make decisions on my own without, without it being a bad thing. As you think about what you want for dinner, it's not that you don't want it, want to know, it's just not that you don't want something, it's that as the self begins to assert itself, right. this very quick defense mechanism no. kicks in and says, do not go there. Don't go there. Because since you've been zero years old, when you go there, something bad happens. Either you were, often it's abused. Often it's right. just like, you know, a, a two-year-old will say, uh, as they often will, I don't want to eat this food. Right. I mean, every two-year-old does that. It's just like, I don't want to eat right now. Yeah. Well, if you got smacked across the face 
or literally, as I've heard stories, driven across town and left on a, a, a sidewalk Ugh. and said, uh, we're done with you. Oh, my God. Uh, to teach you a lesson. Yeah. Um, then you quickly realize I cannot, I can't, I, I'm going to, I just suppress my own yeah. needs and my own wants and my own voice. Right. And the easiest way to do that is to turn away from myself. Yeah. So you are now faced with that. As your husband was there, you were initially, you know, initially he wasn't abusive in all likelihood, but he was, he was very assertive and he said, this is what I want. Yeah. I want to eat this for dinner. And you, and you'd be like, okay, great. Yeah. And it felt good and things worked out well, but he, and he was benefiting because he needed someone to control because that's how he retained his attachments. It's the only way he felt like he could retain attachment is by controlling someone completely and invading their brain, invading their selves. So it worked out for a bit, but then of course it spun out of control and he ended up controlling everything and, and you ended up uh, being so hurt by that that it was unbearable and you wanted to leave. So you left. And so that was actually you looking at you. Yeah, that's true. You, that was, your, your voice was so loud that even though you weren't paying attention, you were turning away from yourself, you heard it because <laughs> it was such a loud voice. Nice. Now, the difference between a hamburger and a grilled cheese sandwich, that is not a loud voice. And so you can't hear it. It's there. Yeah. There's, a, there's a preference between hamburgers and grilled cheese. Yeah. But you, anyway, so... So now he's gone. Hooray. Yeah. Congratulations. Let's celebrate. Now it's like, well, now I have nothing to push against. I have nothing to tell me what to do. I don't. Yeah. So now is the, now is the arduous process of getting to know who you are. Yeah. And that doesn't feel good because mm -hmm. it feels like an emptiness. It feels like a void. You know, that's what you said. It's like, I feel, I feel empty or yeah, I can't remember the word. Empty. That was uh, word. You're not empty. You're, you're full. In fact, your voice has a lot of shit to say because it's never been heard. <laughs> yeah. it, it's got a lot of buildup of things it wants to say to the you and the world. And it, so it's not empty. It's, it's quite full. It's overflowing. It's just going to take time for you to assimilate, to trust that when you turn to the self, it actually, you actually won't be punished. And yeah. that's through your relationship with your therapist. Right. And your own experience. And your own experience, but yeah. it's not easy. It's yeah, it's it's, it's easy. like, it's like you were in a car crash, and you don't want to get back into a car, right? Or you, uh, f you know, fell off of a bridge on accident, right. or a bridge crumbled beneath your feet, and people are proposing you walk across a bridge, your right. body is going to resist that. Right. Or I guess to put it more, you know, viscerally, you're raped horrifically for three years mm -hmm. and someone suggests that you have sex. Mm -hmm. Well, your, your, your cognitive mind is like, well, sure. I, I trust this next partner of mine, but you all, we all know that your body is right. not going to be there. No. Well, your body is not, comfortable looking at the self right. because of the severe punishment or something went wrong when you were young as you look to the self. And so your body is like, okay, cognitively, I get it. I should look to myself, but my body yeah. doesn't want to do it. There and because it goes back to even pre-verbal, you might not even have the ability to even talk yourself through it. It's right. something that takes a long time. Yeah. Um, Good luck. Hang in there. Yeah. So the key is to stay in therapy, heal from your relational traumas, which take, takes time. Uh, internalize the secure relationship with your therapist and other people. Avoid dominant people. This is very important. Because of the way your projective identification works, you're, you're, I can't diagnose you, I don't know, but people like you that I've worked with will socialize other people to be dominant with them, even though they might not be dominant in all contexts. Like there's a way of manipulating other people to be dominant. Like you'll, you'll say, uh, um, you know, just sticking, sticking with what to eat. You'll be like, um, yeah, let's go to dinner. And then your, your friend who isn't particularly dominant is like, yeah, let's do. And you're like, um, you know, where should we go? And your friend is like, oh, I don't know. You know, where do you want to go? And then you say, as a dependent person, you say, um, 
I don't know. I'm just so bad at choosing restaurants. I never know what to choose. Or the last time I chose a restaurant, I completely failed. Um, so I don't know what to do. And mm -hmm. the other person, and then that compels the other person to be like, oh, well, as a favor to you, let me dominate this decision because yeah. I see you crumbling before me. Right. And I don't mind making the choice. And then, and then they make the choice and then you're like, oh, you're such a good chooser. And so you're socializing the other person. There's a lot of other ways to do it, but you're socializing the other person in relation to you to be kind of used to making decisions for you. Right. So you, you want to try to avoid that. There's nothing wrong with those in the micro, but you don't want that to be the overall pattern. So when you're faced with a decision, take the time. You know, take the time to think. What do I want? What do I want? And that's what I always do with people because I've worked on developing this self with a lot of people. I did a whole deep dive on this. Actually, maybe with Bob a year ago-ish or something. What I always do is I ask my clients, don't try to answer the question. Just ask the question. <laughs> just ask. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do I want to do right now? Right. And then you say, I don't know what I want to do. Be okay with that ambiguity. It's not the end of the world. Just yeah. means it just means that you you haven't connected with your voice yet. It's there. Yeah, there's not nothing there. Right. Um, so just ask the question. Keep asking the question. Tell other people to ask you more questions. Oh, interesting. Like I'm trying to develop my own voice. Can you ask me more questions when we get into this kind of situation? So oh, you go nice. to your friend, and your friend's like. Uh, you know, where do you want to eat? And you're like, I don't know. I'm such a bad picker of restaurants. And your friend's like, oh, we're in that situation. Well, what kind of food do you feel like eating? And you think, hmm, well, what kind of food do I, I don't know. What kind of food do you feel like eating? No, no, I'm asking you. Right. What kind of food do you feel like eating? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. So you're in that space. Great. You're not going to be able to access the self right away. It doesn't feel good. But the question and the space and, that, and the fact that the question is being asked, you're trying to access the self right. and you're not being beat and you're not being dominated and right. you're not being controlled and you're not being put down and you're not being told that you're a stupid right. person. The bridge is not crumbling. Right. So there's an in-between zone of like, you ask the question a lot you don't know the answer, but nothing bad happens. And you explore it in your mind kind of, and nothing bad happens. Right. You know, that the more you do that, and I've been with people through this, you know, for months and find that the the voice eventually emerges. Yeah, it'll merge. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we do a lot of uh, assertiveness training in the DBT class. And um, one of the things I've uh, been watching people practice, and like literally we drill. So my my student said to me yesterday, you know, when you make us do it over and over and over again, it's kind of annoying, but I get why you do it. And my clients find themselves saying, my students find themselves saying things that they could not have dreamed of saying before just by sort of trying it out, listening to other people try it out, seeing how it feels. So this one person had a thing where she kept getting stood up at the last minute by uh, somebody that they're dating. And um, um, so they they were really playing with the idea well do you say the word irritated or do you say the word frustrated and almost to a person they came up with it felt bad at first to say irritated that's too big and now saying frustrated feels too wimpy so you you keep standing me up at the last minute it's really irritating me and they're saying it and it's like wow that sounds really good i want you to blah 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 whatever i can't remember what they wanted and um you know i need to be with somebody who actually shows up right um, and and uh, I've seen this happen many times. It feels impossible. Like, yeah, even if I did want that, that's like too big. I can't say that. And then you do it five times. Like just playing with it in a room of people who are supportive. You're not even with the real person. And things start to click and gel. It's nice. So assertiveness is actually, I don't know that they do assertiveness training like they used to do in the 80s and the 90s. But that might be a really good concrete thing for um, this person. Maybe. Yeah. Excellent. Also avoid substances because yeah. for people who are suffering in the way that you're suffering, a good way to ameliorate or numb out is through substances, yeah. which 
can become a problem. Right. A little bit of it isn't going to yeah. ruin the day. But also avoid enmeshing with your own child. You say you have a young child, and it's extremely common. I can't tell you how many times as a family therapist I would see someone with your presentation and your history develop an enmeshed relationship with their own child that ends up becoming a big time issue when the child becomes a teenager. teenager yeah. So, uh, and with so many of those families, right. I would wish I could go back in time right. and be with you, anonymous patron, as a yeah. client when you, when the child was one or two. Right. Uh, so, learn what enmeshment means. Yeah. Learn what over involvement means. Learn what uh, best practices are regarding boundaries with your own kid. Oh, nice. And. Uh, try to approximate that. You'll probably edge towards enmeshment at least, but uh, a little bit isn't isn't going to be as bad as a lot. Yeah. Uh, because what one can do in your shoes is do the opposite and create the same result. Yeah. By being enmeshed and overly friendly, over like a friend to your child. Oh, yeah. Too much of a pushover. Yeah. You can actually create a child who is dominant of you, yeah. who uh, learns that in order to gain attachment security, they have to be dominant. Yeah. And you obviously don't want that. So staying in therapy, maybe consulting with a parenting expert around enmeshment, yeah. uh, would, and maybe even someone observing you with your child over five, 10 sessions nice. with an expert would, would be good. Um, and a big part of that is you having adult relationships that are secure, because if you're a lot of people in, in your position, and again, I've seen this, they will pour all of their emotional attachment energy into their child. It's very easy to do because your child is there and they want you, they want all of you and they're not going to leave you. Yeah. They live with you. Right. They listen to you. You're the world. They want to listen to you. Yeah. They want to tell you all of their life. And it's very easy if you d don't know what's happening that you might be creating a, a situation where the child is actually denied their own differentiating process, differentiation process, because they detect that you need a lot out of their relationship too and that they can't really develop their own self in, in opposition to you which you obviously don't want. I, you know, I'm making a lot of assumptions. Hey, no, you're just sort of uh, trying to um, get all the, all the different nooks and crannies that could be. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm like, you know, your uncle when you're traveling to Africa is like, okay, did you get your <laughs> vaccines? You know, did you, do you have a money belt? You know, I'm that guy. <laughs> um, also, try to find competence. Um, not only... In, in looking at the self, but also in just doing things for yourself and take baby steps, baby steps like, um, you know, go on a road trip with your kid with, with no guidance from other people. Just, just make a choice. Like this is where I'm going because yeah. I, I don't know if I want to go there, sure. but I'm making a choice and I know how to make the hotel arrangements, you know, sure. or challenge yourself at work or, um, or, you know, become a really good parent, for example. Yeah. Also, uh, another kind of in-between step is to find mentors who aren't dominant of you. There's nothing wrong with f wanting guidance. There's nothing wrong with wanting support. There's nothing wrong with wanting someone to uh, give you feedback on your life, someone to look up to. Sure. There is an absolute functional way of having that relationship play out with someone who knows how to not dominate you and ask you the right questions, mm -hmm. but also mentor you. You know, may, maybe you need someone to be like, well, that's not what I would do. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. But so it's not, I'm, t I'm not telling you to completely avoid dependency altogether. Well, that's unrealistic. Yeah. And it's just not healthy. It's I mean, healthy. all of us yeah. uh, benefit from mentors. Uh, therapists could be mentors. Maybe your therapist mentor, but maybe there's other people too. Anyway, let's take a break. Actually, what I want to do, Bob. What do you want to do? 
I want to take a break. But after the break, it's for patrons only. Oh, okay. Wow. Lucky. Lucky for you. So if you're a patron, then you'll hear the rest of this. And if you're not, then you won't hear the the other emails that Bob and I are going to talk about. <laughs> Kirk looks a little devious. <laughs> <laughs> Mischievous. <laughs> yeah. But it, it is. It is devious. It is. Are you right. manipulating? <laughs> I'm manipulating. I'm also asserting my wants. Oh, there you go. <laughs> the, you know, uh, yeah. So please become a patron of the podcast. If you haven't already, go to patreon.com if you want to hear the rest of this episode. Uh, so do that now. <laughs> 